Welcome to this video looking at the intersections of health, athletes, and disability. I'm Erin Morris. With me, I have Kelsey Lefevre and Kathy McCarty. Throughout this video, we will talk about what the definitions of these terms are and how they interact with each other. We will then talk about the history of disability sports and finish by talking about access and pathways to sport for people with disabilities. To start off with, I would like to ask you to pause the video briefly and take a minute to write or draw what you think health is or what it means to be healthy. The World Health Organization defines health as the state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Merriam-Webster has two definitions. The first definition is the condition of being sound in body, mind, or spirit, especially the freedom from physical disease or pain. The second definition is a condition in which someone or something is thriving or doing well. As you can see, there is a lot of emphasis on well-being in the definition of health. Well, the WHO specifically mentions that health is not purely the absence of disease, society often thinks of health or being healthy as not being sick or not needing medical care or having medical issues. However, according to this definition, a person could be healthy even if they have some medical issues, as long as they have a well-rounded well-being, which could be construed to include having a managed disease. Please pause for another minute and take a moment to write or draw what you think it means to be an athlete or what an athlete looks like. Merriam-Webster defines athlete as a person who is trained or skilled in exercise, sports, or games requiring physical strength, agility, or stamina. While nothing in this definition references health, often as a society we think of athletes as being healthy or examples of health, even when their sport may push them to practices that may not be healthy, including disordered eating or overtraining. One more time, I'm going to ask you to pause for a moment, and this time I'd like you to write or draw what it means to you to have a disability or to be disabled. Merriam-Webster defines disability as a physical, mental, or cognitive, or developmental condition that impairs, interferes with, or limits a person's ability to engage in certain tasks or actions or participate in typical daily activities and interactions impaired function or ability. The CDC defines disability as any condition of the body or mind that makes it more difficult for the person with the condition to do certain activities and interact with the world around them. While the definition of athlete does not say anything about ability or disability, the definition of disability could make it hard for people to see people with disabilities as athletes due to the part of the definition it says it limits or impairs the ability to participate in certain activities. If society looks, looks at only able-bodied mainstream sport, that may make it so that people will not see people with disabilities as athletes. But if the definition of sport can be expanded to allow for adaptive and inclusive sports and sport opportunities, a disability may not limit a person's access to sport or the ability to be an athlete and identify as an athlete. Based on the definition of disability, as a society, we often think of people with disabilities as neither being healthy nor as athletes. However, the definition of health explicitly states that it's not just the absence of disease. So, can someone with a physical, mental, or cognitive impairment still be healthy? And if, if they have that well-rounded well-being that the definition speaks of? Additionally, while an athlete may not be healthy, we often equate the two and also assume that if someone has a disability, they do not fit either category. However, disabled athletes exist at every level of sport from recreational to elite. As a society, we need to recalibrate our understanding of these terms so that, so that athletes can view their accomplishments and experiences as not extraordinary or exceptions. Being healthy, athletic, and disabled can function together if society allows them to. They do already, it's just a matter of others' perceptions of that. We will spend the rest of the presentation talking about the history of disability in sport and issues of access to sport for disabled people. 
Now, Kelsey LeFever will start us off by talking about the history of disability sport. Disability sport on the global scene is broadly organized into three major disability classifications, those with physical disabilities, those with intellectual disabilities, and the deaf. Historically, each classification has had its own disability sport organizations overseeing sport and competition for those in each group. Major international competitions for each group have emerged over the last century. We may know these as the Paralympic Games, the Special Olympics, and the Deaf Olympics. The Paralympic Games are the second largest multi-sport event in the world behind the Olympic Games and include athletes that have physical disabilities. The number of participating athletes and sports contested has increased, influenced in large part by the emergence of what is known as the classification system, a set of criteria in which athletes are evaluated based on their disability type, which thus determines participation eligibility. Certain sports include certain disability classifications, which influences which disability groups are able to compete in certain sports at the international level. Throughout its history, disability sport opportunities have emerged with the intent to serve as rehabilitation for those who were injured. One of the founding fathers of Paralympic sport, British neurologist Sir Ludwig Gutman, opened the National Spinal Injury Center at Stoke Mandeville Hospital with a focus on the rehabilitation of injured military soldiers returning from World War II. On July 29, 1948, the day of the opening ceremony of the 1948 London Olympics, the first ever Stoke Mandeville Games were held at Stoke Mandeville Hospital. This was a first step in Gutman's hope of one day seeing an organized sporting event for athletes with disabilities occurring alongside the Olympic Games. From these humble beginnings with 16 athletes competing in the sport of archery, by 1952, the Stoke Mandeville Games included over 130 competitors. The first Paralympic Games are considered to be the 1960 Games that took place in Rome. The Greek preposition para is meant to signify alongside or parallel to the Olympic Games. The 1960 Paralympic Games included 209 athletes from 18 countries in eight sports and 57 medal events. In the 60 year history since, the Paralympics have seen an increase in participating athletes, contested sports, and represented nations, with the 2016 Rio Paralympic Games as the largest summer games to date, with 4,342 participating athletes representing 159 nations and 528 medal events across 22 different sports. The transition of seeing disability sport solely as a means for rehabilitation to one in which athlete experiences are similar to that of able-bodied athletes has done a tremendous amount in situating Paralympic sport as an elite competition. This has included everything from the development of specific training programs to advances in technology that have distinguished sport equipment from everyday mobility aids. More than ever before, the availability of youth programs provides kids with disabilities the opportunity to actually get involved in sport early and try a variety of sports to develop a broad range of skills, both sports specific and otherwise. These opportunities may exist as a community-based program or for some even in school. Disability sport has seen a progression to an activity that one can choose to be part of rather than as something associated with being in the hospital or as a means of therapy or rehabilitation. These opportunities have helped create pathways in what we know to be intentional sport development models, though the availability of such opportunities is still quite limited. Now, Kathy McCarty will discuss issues related to access. Thanks, Kelsey. So in order to dive into a discussion of access, let's just take a step back. Let me ask you this. Are you an Olympic or Paralympic athlete? Do you have any friends that are? Regardless of your answer, what do you think it takes to get there? Take a second to think about it. Even feel free to pause the video and jot down some notes, draw, think about it. 
Just take a moment. Okay, welcome back. So let's take a look at what it might take to be a Paralympic or an Olympic athlete. So what were your answers? Maybe you said something like, they grew up playing the sport. Okay, great. That means that there was likely some kind of school connected program uh, or maybe some kind of private or community training. Um, perfect, what else? How about a coach? A coach who knows the sport. Maybe a place where they can practice, proper equipment for the game itself, money, oof, travel, proper nutrition, trainers, the best equipment, that stuff isn't cheap. What about a family who is willing or able to drive you to all of those practices? For those of you who have played sports at any level, you know that that 5 a.m. wake up call is a real labor of love. What about more broadly, having a community of people around you who believe in that dream for you and actually believe you can do it. With that in mind, think back to your definitions of healthy, athlete, and disability. Was there any overlapping of these constructs for you? How much overlap was there? Do you think the overlap is conducive to believing that a person with a disability could be an Olympic level elite athlete? I mean, we know now after the earlier pieces of this lecture that there is evidence of disabled elite level athletes who are healthy based on how much the Paralympics have grown. And maybe right now the socially acceptable answer is, yes, of course, we all can do anything we put our minds to, right? But how much overlap do you think that there would be if you were to ask the people around you? Your friends, parents and caregivers, community leaders, do you think the level of overlap in the constructs of health, athlete, and disability that exist in your community would have any influence over whether a person with a disability themselves believe they can be a Paralympian? What about how that overlap affects whether there are even adapted or accessible sports um, programs within your community or at the school level? Let me ask you this. Did you grow up playing sports of any kind, even for any amount of time or level? Street hockey with your friends counts. But did your community or your school have any wheelchair sports or any other, other kind of adapted sports leagues? Maybe your high school swim team used a flash of light instead of just the beep noise so that your deaf classmate could be involved. But what, anything else? Unfortunately, based on the research we currently have, spoiler alert, for most of you, the answer was likely no. At this point, you may be saying, but Kathy, building a structure for adapted sports isn't cheap. I don't remember seeing very many kids with a disability in my community, and we live in an economic structure where you supply to meet the demand. If there were more athletes, we would make programs for them, wouldn't we? To that, I would like to throw it back to you. Would we? We see that there are thousands of athletes that basically defy all odds and figure out a way to become a Paralympian despite not having a physical environment or social structure in place that supports their goal. We've seen Paralympic participation grow exponentially and that number only continues to grow. The demand is there. So why haven't we created more programs? Why don't more schools have adapted sports? Why don't we even have accessible parks and playgrounds for kids with a disability to play around in? What's really the thing that's stopping us? Think about your community. What are the barriers to participation where you live? Maybe there aren't any. And if that's the case, please contact us. You'll see our contact information soon. Please tell us so that we can model more programs after your community. But if there are barriers, what are they? Are they physical? Maybe they're social? What's the biggest issue where you are and how can you show up to help solve it? That's our presentation. Thank you so much for uh, your time and attention today. Thank you to the North American Society for the Sociology of Sport for allowing us to do this lecture. Um, please feel free to look at the NAS YouTube channel for more videos and please feel free to contact any one of us with any questions or comments you have about our lecture. Thanks for your time.